Hi. Uh, I'm hoping this is good because it's been a while getting on and I think the internet is not very good in this uh, in this locality. So I hope the uh, stream is working okay. And uh, it's nice to be here. I'm a little bit late because I've been a bit uh, tied up in the old uh, OR. But um, we at last people, uh, they try to uh, block me. They tried to, to uh, silence my voice, but they didn't succeed, did they? Because I'm back. Yes, you're right. I've been blocked from Facebook for the last two weeks, so I've missed these because um, uh, I breached the guidelines on uh, Facebook by uh, posting a, a link to a page on my website which had a picture of gynecomastia, which was a male breast reduction, but I think Facebook must have thought it was a female chest I'm assuming, and I haven't put the little things over the nipples, which I've been in trouble for in the past. So anyway, um, I've been blocked for a couple of weeks, so I have had some messages and things like that, which I haven't been able to reply to. I haven't been able to like or comment on any posts or I haven't even been able to say that I've been blocked. So I'm sorry about that. If it looks like I've been ignoring people, but I am free. Um, and I am able to um, post again. So um, we've got some um, questions, which um, which I will go through. But as ever, you, I'd be very happy to answer questions as, as they come. Um, three things which I've got to remember, which is rip. Oh, actually, I've done them. I've done them. I have prepared this. So um, show that. There we go. What can be done under local anesthetic? Um, this question has come because we've, uh, in fact, just this afternoon, I've done a case, quite a big case under local anesthetic. A gentleman had a large skin graft, uh, a large skin cancer on his head, which I removed and did a split skin graft, took some skin from his thigh and put it on his head, having taken this large skin cancer off. It's a fair old, fair old size. Um, and that was all done completely under local anesthetic. He was completely awake. Well, actually, he fell asleep halfway through, but um, he, he was uh, um, completely awake under local anesthetic. There's two types of uh, local anesthetic. Um, well, anyway, there's two. There's pure local anesthetic, which is just basically injection in the area where you do the surgery, and you are completely compensmentous and completely awake. And then there's local anesthetic with sedation, so-called twilight anesthesia, um, where you have a usually intravenous um, sedative. Um, uh, um, administered, which makes you drowsy and um, uh, and makes you tolerate local anaesthetic a bit better. So things that are done under pure local anaesthetic are um, moles, cysts, lumps, bumps, so say skin cancers, and you can do fairly big big operations under local an anaesthetic. Um, when you get into local anaesthetic and sedation, so so called twilight anaesthesia, you can do quite a lot under twilight anaesthesia. And I uh, put a post out last week because we just done a breast augmentation under twilight anesthesia, which went absolutely swimmingly. Again, she fell asleep, um, but that was probably the anesthetic, uh, the uh, sedation rather than the fact that she was tired. Um, but it was, it went really well. Um, so breast augmentation is quite reasonable to do under a, a low anesthetic. And then someone commented and said, what can you do? Um, and you can, you'd be surprised at what you can do. So, um, I think the patient who commented was asking about breast reduction. Uh, breast reduction is pushing it a little bit, although it can be done. Breast reduction can be done under local anesthetic with sedation. Um, certainly breast lifts can be done with local anesthetic and sedation. Tummy tucks can be done under local anesthetic with sedation. Um, so pretty much most things can be done under local anesthetic with sedation. I'd say the most important thing is that the patient has to be motivated. So if you, if you, if you, we don't really push it, but if people ask for it, we will offer it. Um, because it has to be a motivated patient. And the other thing is, there was another thing. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, well, we uh, normally do it here in uh, a theater which can have general anesthetic. So we normally say to people, look, if it's a bit uncomfortable, if you are um, not enjoying it, then we can always convert to general anesthetic. <clears throat> so we always prepare for general anesthetic. But if you are comfortable, then... Um, and then we can carry on and do it under local anesthetic with the sedation toilet anesthesia. So, yeah, quite a lot of uh, just get that hair sorted out, guys. Um, 
got to get myself looking good on screen. God, that is a shocker. Oh, you see my haircut. Jeez, look at the state of that buzz cut, my wife called it. Is that a buzz cut? I don't know what a buzz cut is, but it just makes me look bald. Just look bald. There you go. Um, so um, that was, so yeah, quite a lot of stuff can be done with local anesthetic if you're a motivated patient. So that's that question there. And we've got other questions coming right up now. So here we go. What can be done about rippling? Here we go, rippling. So this is a patient. I think she's got, um, she, she's thinking of having polyurethane implants. And she's got, um, I think she's got silicone implants at the moment. And um, asking about polyurethane foam implants, asking about um, rippling. And she's got capsules and transfer and all these sorts of things. So, um there's a few questions around this one. I think one question was, what companies in the UK do with polyurethane implants? Uh, Polytech is a German company. It's the only company in the world that do polyurethane implants. So if you want polyurethane implants, that's quite good sometimes because you um, think about it. I hope the audio is and everything's okay here. Just assume it is. Um, if you want polyurethane implants, then uh, they have to pretty much have to be uh, Polytech is a German company um, so in a way that's good you haven't got a choice you know what is it good maybe it's not good but anyway it's what it is um, so that's that Answer that one that was easy um, but what could be done about rippling rippling is a difficult problem to treat and basically rippling is um, a balance between oh good good thank you show I'm gonna show that I can hear you um, so uh, good so the audio is working oh Right, um, so rippling is a balance between the um, uh, breast tissue and um, the breast tissue covering the implant and the implant. So, not said that very well. But basically, um, if you look at an implant, if you hold, sorry, I haven't got any implants, if you hold an implant up, all implants have got ripples on them. And the question is whether you can see the ripples. And so there's two aspects to rippling. One is the actual um, uh, makeup of the implant itself and one is the tissue, soft tissue cover over the top of it. So for a patient who's got rippling then you look at mod modifying those two things. So looking at the implant itself to start off with, um, the older implants are less cohesive than new implants. That means that they are more watery, more runny, which is good because they feel softer and they feel nice when you feel the implants. Well that feels nice whereas newer implants do feel a bit firmer and you're more likely to feel the edges and things. So you think, oh, I'd rather a softer one. But the problem with the softer one is that it ripples more. The worst is like a saline. If you can imagine saline, it's like a bag of, you know, bag of water. Well, it is, I suppose. Um, you know, that ripples a lot. Um, silicone implants ripple less than saline implants, but you get different types of cohesivity with the seat. A silicone implants some are more cohesive got more cohesive gel than others and i think you're looking at uh, teardrop implants and toilet teardrop implants are the uh, are the most cohesive of all the implants because they have to be cohesive because they have to keep their shape if they weren't cohesive gel if it was wasn't made like a jelly if it was a runny gel then it wouldn't be able to keep into a teardrop shape so um uh, so the first thing you do is you look to get more cohesive gel if you haven't got a very cohesive implant in the other thing that you can uh, look at is getting an implant that's got more fill to it. So some implants are like 100% fill, some implants haven't got 100% fill. So that means that the capacity of the shell is not 100% full, if that makes sense. So some of them aren't 100% full, again, to make them feel softer. Some of them are fuller, so make them look um, um, more tense. Hi, Donetta, nice to see you there. Good to see you, I hope you're well. Um, and uh, so you've got to look for one that's completely um, got a sort of 100% uh, fill in it or has got more fill, fill in it. So that's, those are things, the cohesivity of the implant and the um, uh, uh, fill of the implant are things you can look at, uh, particularly if you've got an older implant. If you've got a newer implant, then it might be a, uh, I don't know how long you've had your implants in, but it might already be a cohesive uh, implant already i think you said something like the rippling is due to the capsular contracture and it may be that the capsular contracture is making the implant look uh, smaller is <laughs> um can i thumbs you up i wish i could thumbs you up donetta i don't know if i can um 
but I, I'm giving you a verbal thumbs up for that one, Adonis. So I'm glad to hear that you're well. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, the rippling is caused by capsular contracture. So yes, uh, but I would be a bit careful if you have got visible rippling and you've got capsular contracture, putting it all down to the capsular contracture. I think you should probably think about doing something else if you are going to have, uh, if you want to treat your rippling. So number one is looking at the cohesivity of the implant. If you're changing to a teardrop implant, that's going to be a, uh, um, a more cohesive implant probably than one you've got already. And the other thing you've got to look at is, so there's the implant and then there's a cover over the top of the implant. So I'm assuming you're quite slim um, because rippling is more of a problem in slim people. It's good that you're slim uh, and it's great and it's very nice to operate on people who are slim because there's, you know, um, it makes the operation in some ways easier. But when you're using implants, it makes things a little bit more difficult because you, we, you, we're always trying to hide the implants. And if you're very slim, um, basically, when you've got rippling, you're just seeing the implant. And so you have to think, how can I get some more cover over that implant? Um, the first thing to think about is if you are, are, whether your implants are in front or behind the muscle. If it's in front of the muscle, you could change to a submuscular plane. So that's something that you could consider. Now, when you go to a submuscular plane, that's just in the, get the camera, yeah. just in this area here, sort of top area of the pec. The pec muscle just goes in the top bit. Uh, just covers the, the upper part of the implant because uh, that, that's where the pec muscle goes. It goes from the shoulder across your breast and um, or you, you across your chest. So if you've got rippling on the outer and lower border of the uh, implant, then the, you, the putting it under the muscle won't help that rippling. Um, but usually the problematic rippling is in the cleavage area, and that's where the muscle covers it. Rippling in this area is less of a problem, but also less... Uh, easy to fix. Um, so if you have got rippling in that area or if you already got them under the muscle, um, the other thing you can think of is getting more cover over the top, which means putting on weight. Maybe that's not a great um, suggestion, but the thing also you could do is do fat grafting, which is that's going to seamlessly run into my next question. So fat grafting is another thing you could think of, injecting fat into that layer over the top of the implant which is probably the best way to treat rippling um, if it's an isolated problem and you're not going to change the implant um, because it gives an extra layer of cover over the implant. It's not without its problems because it is you have to get the fat into healthy vascularized tissue. And the reason you've got rippling is because you haven't got much healthy vascularized tissue over the implant. So you can see the implant. So you haven't got much space to put the fat in. So it is difficult to get that fat into that space between the implant and the skin. Also, there's a risk you can damage the implant um, and there's a risk you can introduce infection, which if it gets to the implant, you have to remove the implant. So it's not without its complications and its risks. So um, it is good, um, but you have to have a real problem with rippling in order to balance those risks of all those things that can go wrong um, against the benefits of getting the rippling fixed. Um, so fat grafting is really good for that, although it is, has, does have risk of uh, potential complications. And that is going to bring me right on to my next question. Here you go. Why no photos of fat grafting? So um, this is a patient who contacted me the other day um, who's interested in fat grafting for the breast for a uh, breast augmen um, augmentation. Not sure what that smiley face is, Natalia, but I love it. Um, oh, I, I do. It's got hearts on it. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> um, um, so she's yeah, put an inquiry and says she's interested in fat grafting to her breast and saying, why haven't I got any photos of fat grafting on my website? So um, the answer to that is because I don't do it much. Um, because, um, hey, Natalia, good to see you. Um, um, because I used to do it an awful lot. I used to do it all the time when I did breast reconstruction or when I worked in the NHS. About five years ago, I left the NHS and I did pre predominantly breast reconstruction in the NHS. And I was doing fat grafting most weeks, I would say. I was doing fat grafting um, because fat grafting is fantastic for giving volume to the breast, especially if it's a three-dimensional defect, if it's not a, you know, an implant, it's just sort of fixed volume. But if you've got a contour defect, particularly if it's one breast, obviously re breast reconstruction, you're off often operating on one breast. So fat grafting is um, really good for one breast for localized defects 
when you're looking at cosmetic breast augmentation, fat grafting is less good because you've got to split the fat into two, two breasts. So you go sort of split it in half. And by definition, patients who are you need breast or requesting breast augmentation often are quite slim and have limited donor sites and they have small breasts. So you're limited to where you can put the fat. You aim not to put the fat into the breast itself, putting the fat in the skin beneath between the tissue between the breast tissue and the skin and also underneath the breast. So you're sort of surrounding the breast with fat grafting. So you're limited to where you can put it. So the actual volumes you can inject are limited. And so the results are limited and subtle. And so you often need to repeat it. It's quite expensive. And um, for that reason, I, in my practice, I don't find many people who are candidates for it. And so it is not a big part of my practice. So that is why I don't have many or any photographs on my website for it. Um, I'm very happy to show you photographs of it, but my photographs are all of uh, breast reconstruction uh, where I've augmented the breasts and I've done quite a lot of that, augmenting a single breast uh, following a breast reconstruction. But um, for breast augmentation in my practice, I find that breast implants are still hard to beat and it's pretty limited who the uh, donors so who the uh, people who would benefit from a fat grafting technique would be um breathe so you know what i've been off for eight weeks there's probably more questions but that's the questions i've got at the moment so i haven't really um checked my emails and stuff but uh, i've been in theater all day but um i hope that's been helpful as ever if anyone's got any questions you can comment now do it now because I'm going in a minute. Um, Natasha's got a question. Nice. Nice. See what that does. Direct action. Right, people. Natasha's got a question. Are polyethylene foam implants tricky to place because of the velcro -like texture once they're in? Do they stay where they've been put or do they drop? You know, you see, this is someone who's done, who's done your research. You? She's done her research. Um, so a lot of people who come to me. Oh, actually, the other thing I wanted to say. I will answer that question, but the other thing I wanted to say is that um, I'm very happy to answer questions from to uh, from anybody. As you can see, I'm uh, very happy, you know, welcome questions. It doesn't have to be from patients of mine. It doesn't have to be from people who are coming to see me in the clinic. Um, so uh, I have a closed Facebook group for my patients who they can, you know, interact there. But this is for anyone. So um, in case there was any that um, anyone thought that they couldn't ask because they're not a patient or they're not coming to clinic. I don't, that's fine. No problem at all. I'm just doing this to talk to people. Um, so yes, question, Natasha. Um, our polyurethane, uh, I've been using polyurethane implants for a while now. And um, when I first started using them, there was a lot of stuff saying they're really hard to use. They're hard, well, they're hard to remove. Um, you've got to be careful you place them, all these things, and that is all true. To be honest with you, that is true. They are hard, to, they are quite hard to use, they are more difficult to use. You have got to be careful where you place them, they stay where you place them, they don't really move. Um, so technically, it is a little bit more difficult to use polyurethane implants compared to silicone implants. But as a, from a patient point of view, I wouldn't make it I wouldn't make it something that I would sort of worry about too much because it doesn't really affect you too much. So when you say, when people say, um, are they, um, they don't move and things, that just means you've got to put them in the right place first time. So that's a surgical thing. We've got to make sure we put it in the right place and we can actually use it to our advantage. So particularly if you think of a teardrop implant, because one of the risks of teardrop implants is they can rotate. So polyurethane implants are much less likely to rotate. So that's actually a good thing, the fact that it doesn't move. Sometimes people worry when they hear that polyurethane implants don't move. They think that they're just going to stay there and they don't actually move. They're going to be like, oh my God, they just don't, they're like rocks. You know, they move with your breast. So your breasts move just like your breasts move now and you know um you know they move they they feel and move the same as your breast they do feel a bit firmer than silicone implants to start with particularly if you had silicone implants already <clears throat> they do feel a bit firmer than silicone implants but then they soften they take about a year for them to soften um so yes they are a bit more difficult to place but i wouldn't make that a reason for you not to have them because it just means the surgeon has to make sure they get it right and they placing it in the right place 
that once they're in, do they stay where they've been put or do they drop? I make a point of this in clinic when I see people of showing them photos of polyurethane implants before and after and silicone implants before and after because they are different. And a lot of people go away and they'll Google it and they say polyurethane implants don't move. And so they'll have the surgery and they implant the best will be like that. And they, oh my God, they don't move. I, you know, I'm doomed. They don't move in the same way that silicone implants move. Silicone implants start high and drop. Polyurethane implants start swollen and then settle. It's a bit more subtle with polyurethane implants compared to silicone implants, but they do change. They do start quite swollen and then settle. It's just a softer settling than a silicone implants where they actually drop. Um, so yeah, polyurethane implants are a bit more difficult to place. They're a bit more difficult to move. Here we go. Uh, here we, as if by magic, Helen's in with the, what I was just talking about. Helen, Q Helen. Can polyurethane implants be removed after a year and replaced with smooth implants if you wanted to or not? Yes, they could. Um, um, they are more difficult to remove. Polyurethane implants are more difficult to remove. So after a year, it would be a bit more difficult to remove it than a silicone implant. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, so it is definitely possible and it is um, fine to remove them, but it's just a bit more difficult. It's just the fact that silicone implants are really easy to remove. Um, and they could certainly be removed and replaced with any sort of implants you wanted. And if you want to smooth the implants, that would be perfectly fine. So yeah, it can be done, but it's, yeah, it's more difficult than silicone implants. But if you've already got polyurethane implants in, what choice have you got? They certainly can, they can be removed. Um, but I normally say to people, I wouldn't make that a deal breaker in having them because you're unlikely to have them removed. Although reading between the lines, Helen, I'm thinking you've got them and want them removed, is it? <laughs> because you're saying, can they be removed after a year? Um, you're welcome. So um, so it is unusual to be removed, but if you did have to have them removed, it would be a little bit more difficult. So that is something to think about. If I could thumbs up, I would thumbs up Helen, but I don't know if I can't see the button here. But. Um, oh, that was a late pull, wasn't it? Oh dear. So any other any other questions? Um, oh, I've got a please comment and share thing I can put up somewhere in my menus. Yes, maybe. I was just going to find my please comment and share. Yes, maybe. Maybe more questions, is it? Maybe got another question. Happy to happy to answer another question. There's my please comment and share. There it is. Please comment and share. Whoa. Oh, dear. It's late, isn't it? Late tonight. I'm standing by, Helen. How much should I stand by? Does yes, maybe mean you maybe have another question? Or maybe... Um, if you have got a question, if you put it on the thing, I will... Um, I'll answer it if it's on Facebook. I think there might be a lag. So you might actually have put a question in and I might not see that. I've had that in the book. I've had that before. I've come off this and then there's questions there I've missed that I've missed. Here we go, here we go, here we go. We've got a question coming in, people. Live. Oh my good God, we've got two questions. Oh my lord alive. Oh, so let's go here. Yes, I meant I might have them moved in smooth ones instead. Is that because of ALCL you're having smooth ones, Helen? Why are you having polyurethane removed and having smooth ones put in? That's a unusual things to have done. Hi, Shona. Good to see you. How are you? Um, you know about my band, don't you, Shona? Yeah, I was banned, but I'm back now. So, yeah, that's unusual, Helen, to have them removed. And, but, it's, but, you know, um, if that's, you know, that's obviously something you consider, then that's fine. Um, Natasha's saying, do you get a little movement if they're placed under the muscle? Uh, risk. It's a risk. So I normally say under the muscle there is a risk. There are risks and there are benefits. The risks of um, putting under the muscle is you can get something called animation deformity, which means when you exercise, you're moving your pec major, your breast moves because your breast is sort of underneath your muscle, your, pec, your implants under the muscle. So that is a risk. Animation deformity is a risk. Um, and... Um, they can also sit wide when they're under the muscle and they can sit high when they're under the muscle. So there are bad things that can happen when they're under the muscle. But the good thing is the muscle gives it an extra layer of cover. So your rippling and what have you is better. So balance is a balance. But there is a risk of – I wouldn't say you get a lot of movement if they're placed under the muscle. I'm saying that there's a risk of animation deformity if you put on the muscle. I'm not saying you'll definitely get an animation deformity. You might not get an animation deformity. But if you do a lot of work in the gym, you might be something that you have to consider and think about. So that is a thing. Thank goodness. Thanks, Shona. Yeah, back at uh, 
back back just to make sure i don't post any more dodgy photos and i should be fine so um that was a good good bit of interaction there thank you for that <laughs> well, let's just stand by oh thank you thank you no thank you natasha for asking questions i love it love it mad for it any question think of any question direct message me or get on here and ask me next week should be back next week same time same place um so uh, so i'll check out if that's all right um check myself out and i will see you next week here i'll probably be late next week i think i've got a long list next week as well so um but it, but i'll be here sometime assuming they're not bad again anyway have a lovely evening. Bye.